I want to begin this morning with the first verse of a poem by the American poet Elizabeth Bishop. It's called One Art, and the poem begins as follows. The art of losing isn't hard to master. So many things seem filled with the intent to be lost that their loss is no disaster. And she goes on to talk about how you should lose something every day just to get used to the idea of losing because we will lose so much, so go ahead and lose your keys. You'll lose the houses you lived in. She said, I lost my mother's watch and look, my last or next to last of three loved houses went. The art of losing isn't hard to master and today I wanna to talk about something that we are in danger of losing. But it's something big and something important. It's Israel. I don't know how carefully you are following what is going on in Israel, but it is terrifying. And if you don't know what is going on, then let me help you, even if you do know, understand it more deeply. Israel had multiple elections because it is such a divided country that it couldn't manage to put a government together. And when it did, it put a government together by the slimmest of possible majorities. And in that government, was someone who had been barred from serving in Israel's military because of his racist views, but he's now Minister of Justice. And in that government is a minister who suggested that a village should be wiped out and only when the world screamed did he bother to clarify that he didn't really mean the village should be wiped out, just the terrorists in it. It is a government that is about to propose a judicial reform against which hundreds of thousands of Israelis take to the streets to protest again and again, and it's not just the people who take to the streets. A recent survey found that a majority of voters oppose each of the government's main judicial proposals, including substantial numbers of those who supported the coalition. If you ask Israeli voters, do you prefer the current way of selecting judges or the government's way of selecting judges, which would give much more power, by the way, to the government, 63%, that is almost two-thirds of Israelis, say, I prefer the current way. So you have a government with a slim majority making major radical changes in the way Israel will be governed, and that, first of all, creates tremendous social dislocation. There's an enormous internal fight going on in Israel right now. And it's not as simple as right and left. Don't think of it in American terms, and I will tell you why. Because the economic engine of Israel is largely on the left. The ultra-Orthodox communities, which are mainly on the right, have many virtues, but economic productivity is not among them. They don't contribute very much to Israel's economy. You know who does? The equivalent of Israel's Silicon Valley. Startup nation in Tel Aviv, and guess which part of the political spectrum most of them find themselves on? And guess how many of them have said, the day this passes is the day I take my business and I bring it to Silicon Valley. And let me tell you, Silicon Valley is waiting with open arms. It's not like when Hollywood stars say, oh, I'm gonna to move to Denmark if so-and-so is elected. And then all of a sudden you find they're elected and they haven't moved at all because after all, this is where their life is. This is where their economics is. That's not true for Israel when they, when. The prime minister said that his reforms 
will make Israel economically more productive, 35% of Israelis said they agreed. That means 65%, almost two-thirds, think that it will hurt Israel's economy and badly. And if that is not enough, it is being protested by the military. Just yesterday or the day before, 200 reservists in the Air Force said they will not fly if these laws pass. Israel cannot afford to lose the military. And again, remember, the military in Israel is not like the military in the United States. It doesn't skew politically one way or another because everyone serves in the military. Which means that it is just as divided as the electorate. And when the military starts to say we're not going to serve in a country like Israel where God knows we need the military, we have the makings of a catastrophe. What is supposed to happen now is that the law is supposed to go for judicial reform to the Supreme Court. In other words, a law saying to the Supreme Court, you're going to have much less power, is about to go to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, according to most expectations, is going to strike down the law. The government has already made sounds that if you strike down the law, we won't recognize that striking down because we think you have too much power. Imagine a society in which the Supreme Court and almost half the society strike down the law and the other half doesn't recognize that. This is not about what American Jews think about Israel. This is what about Israelis think about Israel. This is not about us. This is about us. All of us. And if you haven't been following, let me tell you, you read the newspapers in Israel, right, left, and center, which I do, and it is terrifying. So the president of Israel, Bougie Herzog, after consulting with people from both sides, came out with a plan for compromise, at least to start the discussions, submitted it to the prime minister, who in 15 minutes said no. Did not even entertain the possibility of talking about it. I don't know why. The rumors are because members of his coalition said that they would leave if he talked about it, and so he felt his hands were tied. All I know is that when a country is in crisis and there are two sides, if you don't talk, you don't solve the crisis. I don't have an answer. I can't tell you what Israel's judicial reforms should be. It's complicated. And even if it weren't complicated, I don't know. But I do recognize a country being torn apart. I've seen it before. Except that this country is being torn apart more radically. And this country can't afford it. To the extent that American Jews can raise their voices, I think that what we ought to do is not raise our voices to say this side is right or that side is right. I mean, if you want to, gay gesund hate, go ahead. Be happy, do it. But I think that we have to insist that the two sides talk to each other. That without a discussion and without a dialogue, they are headed in a direction that nobody, nobody in our community, in our world, who wishes Israel well, nobody wants to see. I love Israelis, but I don't want to see them all emigrate to Silicon Valley. 
and I don't want to see them at each other's throats. And if they don't start talking, not just protesting, not just insisting, not just giving speeches, but talking to each other, then I'm afraid that we'll be reading the last verse of Elizabeth Bishop's poem, even losing you, the joking voice, a gesture I love, I shan't have lied. It's evident the art of losing's not too hard to master, though it may look like, write it, like disaster. Right now, it looks like it might be disaster. We have to wake up. We don't have a lot of time left. And we live in a world that does not always wish us well. Shabbat Shalom.